Well, those involved in equestrian industries are less concerned with the blame game. They just want to get on with the job during the equine lockdown. Thoroughbred racing is making a staged return after outbreaks of equine influenza detected in the state's southeast and west prompted a ban on meetings and movement. The Eagle Farm meet in Brisbane tomorrow will be the first racing event open to the public since the crisis began a fortnight ago. But for many who make their living from the industry, the crisis is far from over and the number of infected properties keeps rising. Christina Harrison reports. After nearly a fortnight at a standstill, they were finally off and racing again on Wednesday at the Gold Coast. It was a bit disappointing without racing, but it's good to be back racing now. But with no one cheering them on from the grandstands or placing bets with the bookies, the atmosphere wasn't quite the same. You know, we're all just thankful that racing's on its way. People don't catch the virus, but they can actually carry the virus back to their own, own animals. So it's, uh, it's basically taken an ultra-cautious approach at this stage. Tomorrow's meeting at Eagle Farm will be the first in Queensland to let spectators into some parts of the grounds. Only local horses will be allowed to compete. Providing everyone adheres to the restrictions and no one does anything silly, I can see probably a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. But not everyone in the industry is back on track yet. Dressage coach Nicole Tuff is dividing her time between horses at her Gold Coast property and others at Warwick. She's one of about 200 people whose flu-infected animals have been quarantined at Morgan Park for a month. The countdown to the end of the lockdown started this week. The spirits dampened uh, last night. The weather came in bad and it's raining and it's cold and it's windy and it's hard to be away from your family, it's hard to be away from the horses at home. It's hard being a bit isolated from the rest of the country, not knowing what, what, what's happening. She's had to stop coaching and training, and horses she planned to sell can't go anywhere. Normally today, the place would be really busy. I'd have three, four lessons a day, the farriers in chewing horses. For those employed by the equine industry, this outbreak is causing considerable anguish. Not knowing when life and work will return to normal is forcing some to seriously consider a change of occupation. A few of my colleagues have, have um, done different courses and machinery operated courses and stuff like that. They're, they're seriously thinking about this, they've had enough. The Brisbane farrier won't pack away his tools just yet, but he has had to lay off his apprentice. He can no longer travel from farm to farm making and fitting shoes because of the risk of transferring the flu. We probably do around about 30 to 40 horses a week and now we're basically to a standstill. We'll survive but just, it's, um, yeah, it's not a real good way to make a living. Queensland Pony Clubs and their 1,200 members are also feeling the brunt of the outbreak. All the pony clubs in the southeast and right throughout Queensland are like this one. They are in lockdown. For now, no one's allowed in or out of the clubs for fear of spreading the virus and making more animals sick. The effect on the young children, the young riders, would be just terribly traumatic for them. Many of the riders will have to sacrifice hopes of competing at state events planned for the coming months. It's a very dramatic time. Our main objective is to contain it within the areas it's in now. There is help on hand for those in dire straits. There are equine influenza hardship grants, while the federal government is offering compensation of up to $1,500 for those in immediate need. Back, back at the beach shack, I'll meet you back. Everyone came for the surf, uh, the Brisbane crowds came down every weekend, uh, they could drive or come on the railway and that continued right through into the, into the 80s. It was easy access for children and the mothers to get the kids and the older people to swim in the inshore smaller lagoon and we were still able to surf and ride waves here because there was an outer bank. We've got one of the best point breaks we ever had in the world. It's the number one surf break. Kelly Slater, the nine times world champion, raved about this spot. That was then. This is Kira now.
a wide expanse of sandy white beach at the southern end of the Gold Coast and a swell that's virtually flatlined. It's not a board riding or surfing beach anymore, it's just a closeout. About eight years ago, the Queensland and New South Wales governments committed to a project to pump a massive build-up of sand out of the Tweed River mouth and send it north. It looked like a win-win situation. The Tweed would be safer for boaties and the sand would replenish eroded Gold Coast beaches and protect valuable infrastructure along the coastline. On the southern Gold Coast, our beaches are great. They're, they're, they're fantastic in terms of the protection that they're giving our properties. It's just that they're a bit too fantastic and there's too much sand sitting in some spots. Kira has suffered most, prompting passionate locals to speak out. What do we want? Bring back Kira! Renowned surfers headlined an Australia Day rally this year. Eight years later, they've killed off a surf break, a reef break, they've left the beach like a deserted oasis. We used to have uh, small horse rides and camel rides on the beach. Well, the size of the beach at the moment, I'd say leave the horses out and bring the camels back. Business and tourism have been affected, forcing some to shut up shop. To lose that, that surfing wave at Kira is very substantial in terms of the loss of amenity for our locals and for our tourists and also for our tourism industry here on the Gold Coast. Kira board riders haven't had, their, haven't had a club event here for probably close to eight years and we have lost the Quicksilver Pro from Kira and a lot of you know, high profile events on the Gold Coast would probably come here from time to time if this break was back. But Kira has lost more than its break. Marine biologist and Kira local Bob Moffat says the reef has all but disappeared and so too have the dive businesses. The reef's been completely covered. Uh, there used to be a rich ecosystem and now this ecosystem is reduced to just a few fish and, and very little reef at all. Locals say they tried to warn the government all of this would happen even before pumping started. Uh, local knowledge from a lot of people, I mean, talking about hundreds of locals that really know the area and what happens uh, hasn't been uh, really taken into account. What we've been trying to do is to get amendments to the agreement between the two states so that the volume of sand that's placed in the bay can be placed on demand or placed in outlets to the west and north of here. The local members been trying to find out which, if any of their suggestions, made it into the contract. It is within these contracts between New South Wales and Queensland that the truth lies and until we have our hands on the contracts we really are not able to clearly ascertain the extent of the issue. The state government has honoured its election promise to do something to fix the problem with a $1.5 million project. Some of the money was recently used to remove 20,000 cubic tonnes of sand but the question now is how the rest of the money should be spent. Stage 2 could see another 200,000 cubic tonnes taken away, but that's open to public comment until next week. The mid-term and long-term solution means creating sand dunes, cutting a contour into the beach, dredging the reef and then using those sand pumping outlets where we need them. Pump on demand, pump where is required. It seems the new minister responsible for the environment is in agreement and has a New South Wales counterpart on side two. Kate Jones says at the moment sand is being diverted back over the border. Tony Kelly and I were, have agreed that we will be working with the contractor to ensure that we get greater flexibility within the contract so we can deliver better outcomes not only for Kira Beach but also for northern beaches in New South Wales. Ms Jones says she'd like to see action on stage two this year and have a long-term plan ready next year. I think if uh, they take on board some of our ideas and fine-tune and fine manage the whole situation. It'll be a win-win situation for fishermen, divers, surfers, swimmers and beach lovers and even catamaran sailors. We're about the halfway mark but there's still such a long way to go to save Kira. I got an eight-foot mama rolling through my veins.